today to start a conference, um, to start the day, we have a conference uh, from Mr. King Wong Poon. He is the director of the Lee Kuan Yew Center for Innovative Cities at the Singapore University of Technology and Design. We also had the Smart Cities Lab at the Future Digital Economies and Digital Societies Initiative. <coughs> Mr. Poon and his team multidisciplinary research focused on human dimensions of smart cities and digital economies and the impact of digital transformation on the future of work, education, healthcare, and society at large. He has served in the Economic Development Board, Ministry of Law, Agency for Science, Technology and Research, and the Competition Commission of Singapore. In the private sector, he was head of business analytics at one Singapore's largest bank and was a strategic advisor to a mobile local, local search startup. King Wong holds a master's from Stanford University, a bachelor from University of Illinois in the US, and certificates of engineering from Moscow State Technical University. Thank you very much for being with us this morning. Can I check if everyone can hear me? It's not too loud. It's okay, the microphone? Right, okay, let's get started. So I'm Poon Keng Wang, Director of the Lee Kuan Yew Center for Innovative Cities. Uh, welcome to Singapore. I understand some of you have been here for a few months and some of you just arrived over the weekend. The topic of my presentation today is living together and the subtext is really imagining and building a better life together. First, I want to thank you for inviting me. Interestingly, about a year ago, I did come to ESAC to give another presentation and another class, and somehow that became the first of several interactions with French organizations, including, for example, Live with AI, which is a French Singapore think tank started by a French expatriate community here. And then I, of course, had a chance to go to Paris twice, one was to Viva Tech, and recently I just went to give another presentation at Smart Nation. And of course, because of my interactions, we were asked to contribute a commentary to Le Seco. So it's really nice because close to the end of one year after that very first presentation, I'm back here again, kind of like a nice way to wrap it up. And I hope this is just the first year of many more interactions with French institutions and French students as well as uh, anybody, anything to do with France. It's a nice place. I was asked if I could share with students the following. Uh, my experiences discuss topics on imagination, creativity, and influence on our work. And after a co telephone conversation last week, I decided to structure my presentation this way to you. First, of course, will be an introduction. I'll talk a bit about myself, about my organizations, and a bit about Singapore. But my reason for doing that is more to show you the type of work that we do, what influences our work, our experiences, and expertise. The next thing I'll do, as you can see, I have living something in three stages, in three time frames. It's meant to give you a sense, for example, of the first one, how Singapore has reimagined what living together in Singapore might mean. And I start off with that because I also know that not many of you would have the time, as much time as we would like for you to visit the rest of Singapore. So by doing this, I also have to give you a sense of what life in Singapore is like and what is it that, about Singapore that makes you see the things around you. The second part of my middle section will be Living Digital 2040. This is the work that we do in the center. Uh, we do a bunch of future scenarios. We think about how the future should be and what we should, what we should, how we should respond. And what I want to focus here is on future of work because that's a very topical issue and we need to settle that because a lot of people around the world, including in Singapore, are at risk of being dislocated from work. And we want to find a good solution to help people who are maybe suffering, who may be displaced, to make sure they continue to be resilient. And the last one is Living Cities 2050. It's more an invitation to you to imagine with me and reimagine with me what living in the future would be like in the face of climate change, in the face of sustainability. So that's kind of my middle section. And then after that, I'll conclude and we'll have a nice Q&A following that conclusion. So let me get started on introduction. Uh, let me first talk about Singapore. Uh, you would already know Singapore is not very large. Uh, it's quite small. I described it as if you take the middle of Paris and you go to the Charles de Gaulle, it's about that distance. That distance is the distance of Singapore north to south. If you go to Charles de Gaulle and come back, right, that's the distance east to west of Singapore. And then it's small. And so one of the interesting things that I noticed is there was a person who worked in Singapore for three, four years and he decided to write a book about Singapore. He's returned to the UK now. 
But the way he wrote the book was he decided to take a walk from the morning from one end of Singapore to the other end and he described everything that he saw just in one day across the whole island. And that was how he described his experiences in Singapore. Because it's a small place, uh, it's a small country, there's the city, the government, the people have always been very paranoid about survival, have been very paranoid about keeping its edge. And so Singapore University of Technology and Design, where I come from, was actually a response to what we felt were the challenges of tomorrow. Singapore has always been a manufacturing hub. We industrialized, we invited multinational investors to come in, set up factories, and then we re-exported them out to the world. That's how we made the jump into economic development, made the jump to social development. But we realized that that model, because of China, because of developing economies, because of many, many competitive reasons around the world, is not tenable. So we needed to be able to take, jump to the next stage. The next stage was that we wanted to move from just making things Right, to be able to create our own product solutions and services. And the way to do that was to start a new university so that we'll train students right, who are, have that mentality, have the attitude, have that, those skills. And this is quite typical. If you look at many smart cities or any country or any city that's transforming itself, you'll find that the university will always have a role to play. So one of the key topics today will, of course, be what is the role of the university as you think about the future, as you reimagine what is possible for your country, your city, or for even entire regions, because there's another topic of discussion happening all around the world. So as part of Singapore's strategy to be more innovation-led, they set up SUTD, and they knew that they had to plug into two big innovation ecosystems of the world, the US through MIT, and through chi to China through Zhejiang University, which is in Hangzhou, south of Shanghai. And the idea was to train engineers and architects, not in a conventional way, but in a way that would give them strong design sensibilities, because design integrates things, helps to understand human needs and produces things that they want. And of course, to make sure that in face of climate change, to be able to develop things that are sustainable, whether they are buildings or products or even small little sensors. I come from, I work in a university. I have a portfolio there as a senior director of strategic planning as well. But concurrently, I also direct the Lee Kuan Yew Center for Innovative Cities. Uh, we are fortunate to be one of the two institutions to have our founding prime minister's name. So I say that it's both a responsibility as well as a privilege. It's a responsibility to give back to Singapore, to be able to integrate all these multiple disciplines, and then to allow that to then come up with good solutions and good ideas that policymakers and company leaders could use. And doing so, make an impact on company policies, make an impact on public policies, and in that sense, create a better Singapore for tomorrow as well. So, Underlying that is really just how we do things. This is one of the teams that I lead. This is the team that looks at smart cities, look at future digital economies and societies. You notice we're not just multidisciplinary. We're also what I call multi-skill. We study the technology. We study how the individuals are so using psychology. We study societies. We study strategy. We study organizational. And our job is to then say sometimes there are certain things that you consider at one level. Seems perfect, but once you start considering across levels, there are trade-offs. And so we created a team, a structure and an approach that allows us to look at those trade-offs even at a research standpoint and not just give one solution based on a particular discipline. So today's presentation is a lot based on the, that approach, a lot based on some of the thinking that we have in the approach that we use. But I also tell you that today's presentation is highly personal because these photos on the right-hand side, the top two photos is the river I, used, I grew up in because this was what Singapore was like not so long ago, 40, 50 years ago. And I grew up in a public housing flat. The river was not cleaned up yet. It was full of trash. And the, and the picture you see in the middle is when there was a heavy thunderstorm. Because the river that I lived along was connected to the farms up in the north. It's not a very big country, remember. There will be dead animals flirting down from the farms that had drowned. Right? And this is the river as it looks today. It's nice enough that on the day when I got the chance to actually go home earlier, I actually sat down for just five, 10 minutes to have a snack and to have a nice drink. So today's presentation is also highly personal because I've personally experienced and lived through what it means to have a life that's better and to live together better as well. So let's jump into the imagination part and how different entities, different groups in Singapore reimagine what life would be like. Let's start with living 1965 to 2019. 1965 is of course when Singapore became independent. So we're very young. Uh, before that, we were a British colony uh, and then part of Malaysia for a while, but that's a history lesson for another day. 
And what we did was, it was a small country, survival odds were not high, and very little number of resources were about 2 million people, highly a market, if anything, highly even a, a large labor workforce. So we had problems, right? And the way Singapore did it was, let's look at solving problems. But because we couldn't just take the solutions from other countries, different size, different context, different environment, we had to reimagine what the solutions might be. And let me just give you three examples on this slide. First is, it's a very hot country. Uh, some of you who arrive here for the first time from winter will say, it's so nice, it's so warm. Right? But it's a different story if, we, if you're living here for look, 365 days a year. It becomes humid. And our joke is that you, everybody says that Singapore has no seasons. Well, I tell you, we do have four seasons. It's called hot, hotter, hottest than a shopping mall. <laughs> right? When it gets really, really hot, you go to the shopping mall. So, which explains why there are so many shopping malls in Singapore. It's not because we like to shop, we like the air conditioning. And it's a good way to get cheap air conditioning. Right? So we had to do something. Right? Obviously, the joke is we could put a bubble, an air con bubble over Singapore and then say, oh, Singapore air conditioning, but it's not possible. So the next best thing was, let's just decide that if we cannot make Singapore cooler and it's going to be urbanized, then let's just try to build more greenery in Singapore. So we borrowed ideas and you know, in Paris, in the UK, in many cities in, in Europe, you've got nice parks everywhere, we borrowed the idea. So we've got parks everywhere and we built, put trees everywhere. We've got easily a million or more trees in Singapore along the roads and everything. And what that does is it does bring down the temperature a little bit. And the latest evolution of the idea is that we're not just a garden city, but we're in a city in a garden. And that's kind of a nice idea. To show you how serious the government was, they started thinking about it in the 1960s. And the joke was that, you know, our second prime minister wrote uh, once that said that they must be the only cabinet in the world that has to read a report about flowers, greenery, trees, and flora and fauna in the cabinet meeting. And that was how seriously they took this. Right, so how to keep a tropical city-state cool? You turn it into a city in a garden. Then how do you find land? We don't have a lot of space. We need it. We have places where we dump the trash and so on. But you know, it's just a terrible waste of a space. So after we decided that we would clear the landfill, we had to make the landfill uh, usable. And so what they did was spend about 10, 15 years rehabilitating the land using biological reintermediation. And now what you see is that you've got now people walking over to what was formerly a landfill to enjoy as a park. Right? And you know, if there's any indication, you've got wedding couples even walking over to a formal way and take wedding photos. That's not bad. And lastly is we had a water problem. Um, when we were asked to leave, when we became independent, we were asked to leave Malaysia. Most of our water came from Malaysia, you know, piped down the water and so on. And, uh, to kind of put us in our place. So it's a, water is a geopolitical problem as well for us. To kind of keep us in our place, the Malaysian government said, you know, if you don't behave as our little country in the neighborhood, we'll just turn off the taps, right? So it was an existen existential problem, it was a political problem, it was a geopolitical issue, it was a survival issue. And so we said, what do we do, right? We didn't have enough water. And we decided, for, fortunately for Singapore, we're in the center of a, the equator where there's many tropical storms, we calculated that if you collect every single drop of water that landed in Singapore's uh, ground, you had enough water to meet both consumption as well as industry needs. And so for, they put in place a 100-year plan to actually make sure that all the waste, all the water that falls on the ground would then go into our reservoirs. And that effort to clean up the rivers, remember the photos I showed you earlier, to clean up the rivers, to put the sewage systems together, to put the waterways together so that all the water will flow into the reservoirs, right, has been a long-term effort. And we are about 70 to 80% supplying our own needs now. Chances are in another 30 to 40 years, we'll be 100% self-sufficient. Not just by collecting water, but by desalination as well, recycling water, and lastly, if need be, we can still get some water from Malaysia. And the idea was to just collect every single drop of water. And the joke here is that the military of defense, the Singapore Armed Forces, decided that one day to try to save money by collecting rainwater to wash their military vehicles. The Public Utilities Board, which is the board in charge of the water, sent them a note to say that stop it. Any water that falls in Singapore belongs to the Public Utilities Board. Stop it or else I'll fine you. So this must be one of the few cases in the world where the water authority is more powerful than the military. Right? So this tells you how serious we are about the water issue.
But all these things are really about just how we solve problems and how we reimagine what is possible. And I give them today not as a history lesson or not as a case study, but to say that what we are doing today also has some resonance with how we could solve problems, not just in Singapore, but potentially for other places around the world. A good example is that beyond just you know, the solution, we are also making sure that people live better. So for example, everyone loves the parks. Now you try to take away a park, people will write into the ministers and tell you, please don't do that. And they go into social media and complain. Right? People are helping to conserve water, and I've talked about how even wedding couples are going over to the wasteland, so it must be insta-worthy. Uh, another good example is actually housing. Uh, many cities and many countries around the world are now worried about providing affordable housing uh, for those who are not in the top income bracket. So for the middle class, for young people moving to cities, for young people working. And we, we've kind of settled some of that problem. And let me explain how we did it because you're going to see a lot of that in Singapore. Because 80% of, oh, of the population in Singapore lives in public housing. And of the 80%, 90% actually own their flats. That's a tremendous statistic, a tremendous number. But how do we get to that? It didn't happen overnight. Those shop houses you see there are maybe about 20 minutes drive away. It's called Duxton Hill, Duxton Road. And this is where people usually lived, and this was you know, pre-1960s. In fact, I picked this photo because this is where my father and my grandfather lived. And they lived on the top floor. Why top floor? Because you know, now, nowadays, if, the top, if you live at the top floor, it's the most expensive. It's called the penthouse, right? Well, in the old days, because there was no elevator, so you had to walk up, the top floor was the cheapest. And it wasn't just the top floor was cheapest. They took the cheapest accommodation on the top floor, which at the back, where there was no sunlight, so very little light. And my father tells me stories when I was growing up, probably to scare me, right? tell me how lucky I am, that when he slept on the floor, and in the middle of the night, they could see few rats running over their feet as they slept on the floor in, 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 uh, at night. So this was what most people lived in. And then today, if I take the same picture, I, I went for a walk with my dad a few years ago. If you take the same picture, this same development here is actually this here. And of course, you can see it's gentrified, right? Like most cities, conserved parts, it's gentrified. And now it's a nice pub, and you know you go there for wine, and probably no rats or anything. But I took this picture also because if you take a look behind at the tall building, that's actually a public housing in Singapore, and it's one of the nicest public housing because it was an experimental conceptual thing. Uh, we may not see see one just as nice in the, for a very long time, but it's a nice public housing. It gives you a sense of how public housing is different in Singapore. We decided that we'll provide public housing, but it'll be good quality public housing. The reason was very simple. We were an immigrant population that we had to find some way for people to feel that if something happened to the country, they would stay and fight, right? And the way to do that was to give them a stick, and the best way to do that was to give them something like an apartment, a housing, so that they feel that, ah, this is, I have some chips to play with, I can do something, this is my life, I can create a better life here. And so that's how Singapore began its public housing project. And what you see here is actually a public housing that's fairly new, maybe 10, 15 years old as a housing estate. And if I were to tell you that one of them is public housing and one of them is private housing, you can probably make a quick guess which is public, private, private housing and which is public housing. But you can also see that it's not a big difference, right? If you want to know, this is actually private housing. This is public housing. And the fact that they're close together, there's no like artificial lines you know, of, of public, private, and at the same time, it's high quality, gives you a sense of the seriousness, seriousness we bring to the public housing issue. And I think that's something else to think about as we think about how we reimagine how to provide good stuff for people in the, in the population in the city. Now, I, I've just shown you pictures and buildings, right? And you know, you go like, oh no, and I have pictures and buildings, I feel like an academic tourist, right? So what I want to do is, don't just listen to me, listen to this video. Uh, two Japanese who are working here decided, suddenly got interested in what was public housing like in Singapore, and they went around to do almost like ethnographic anthropological study of public housing in Singapore. And the local newspapers picked it up and created this video. So I'll just let, you, to, let these two Japanese tell you about how they got to living in public housing and what they saw in public housing.
Okay, so there's just a quick uh, short snippet insight into life in Singapore. And the idea behind that was that we provide good quality environment, good housing, the financing to go with it, but inside the flat, you can do whatever you want, right? And that's where the cultural part comes in. So this is a nice photo of uh, one of the blocks of flats, and you can see it's just different in many ways. And just to wrap up this section about living 1965 to 2019 today, I think what the experiences and what you could take away could just be that, you know, we had constraints, severe constraints. And what we did was use the imagination, use a bit of technology, use policy to overcome them. And in doing so, you just make lives better for everybody. Okay, so that's living 1965 to 2019. Then we go to Living Digital 2040, which touches directly on the work that we have been working on and we're trying to move the needle a little bit in the conversation about our future. The problem with a lot of discussions about our future is you get what I call buzzword bingo, right? You go for a presentation and you know, you can probably, I can bet with you, you know, 60% of presentations you hear about the future will have 60% of these words. And I used to joke with the audience and you can do this too, you can take a picture of this if I say any of these words more than three times, right, just jump up and say bingo and I'll give you a present or something, right? So that's the problem, right? It's just full of buzzwords and, you know, it's just not very helpful. At the same time, there are people who make projections about the future, in this case about future of work, and what the MIT Tech Review did about a year ago was they went to look at all the reports there are about future of work. And then they say, okay, some will say jobs will be created and some will say jobs will be destroyed. And then some will say oh, it will happen in 10 years, it will happen in 5 years. And the conclusion of the MIT Technology Review Report was that there are as many predictions as there are experts, and the problem is that predictions are all over the place. So again, not very helpful. So simply because what is out there is important for getting the awareness up, for understanding the issues, but the reality is for many public policy people, for company strategists, for business people, you need to know what to do next. And so that is why we embarked on this project that we started about four years ago, and the first outcome of that project was a book called Living Digital 2040, just published last year. Uh, it's gotten a bit of interesting traction because we actually have a Korean publisher who wants to uh, publish it, they look into publishing it. But it was funded largely by the National Research Foundation, the Singapore government. The idea was, can we ask ourselves, move beyond the buzzwords, move beyond the projections, ask what actually we could do. And so the rest of my presentation in this section will touch on some of our findings in the future of work. And I've combined it with some of our more recent understanding from two other programs which I lead, which is the Smart Cities Lab, as well as the Future Digital Economies and Digital Societies. So first off, what we did was we created a bunch of scenarios. We wanted to say, what are the different segments of people that will be affected? And so of course you have the people on the top right hand side who do very well, the Roaring Revolutions. There'll be some who won't do so well, do not do as well, but they'll still do okay, right? Just chuck along and, but life will be all right. Then there'll be some who will just really slip into the bottom of the pit and they won't be able to recover. And then on the top left-hand side, you have people who will struggle, right? The question then is, can we have move more people from this side all the way to this side? And the question is, how do you do that? And if you want, as we've presented these scenarios to different people, some of those we presented said that this seems to reflect different segments in society. This might be the middle class, this might be, a raw, this might be the elites, these are the people who are low income, poor, and these are the ones who are slipping out of middle class. At the same time, some others say, actually, I think you are talking about different countries or cities. And then another person even said, I think you're talking about different stages of development. So it's useful because think about whether it's individuals, countries, cities, how do we move them from this side to this side? And a clue to what we could do comes in this other report that we actually saw. And it's nice because it validates what we do. The World Economic Forum published a report on the future of jobs in 2016. They also published one last year. And without the need for use of any artificial intelligence, we just did a control F right, in our PDF document. And we counted the number of word times the word skill came up, 719. Okay, fine. That's usually what people focus on when it talks about disruption. But we also noticed that I only counted the word task nine times. Come 2018, the word task had gone up by 150 to 153, and the skill work kind of started to come down. In business terms, which is the growth industry and which is the slightly mature industry, you can tell. The reality is that jobs are not replaced 
by technology, job by job, or even skill by skill, they replace task by task. And if you use that very basic principle, you can do a lot of amazing things with it. And I want to tell you what we are doing with this very simple idea that jobs are replaced, not job by job or skill by skill, but task by task. Let me explain what we are doing. Take the information security analyst. We think his job is secure now because there's cyber attacks everywhere. But they're not so secure because in the United States, for example, in DARPA, the Military Defense Advanced Research Institution, they are looking at auto patching of cyber attacks. So, so much for the security of the job of the cyber security expert. But let's imagine that he does 10 or 12 tasks. And what you could do is, usually if you do a certain task, they're similar to tasks in other occupations, right? So in this case, I show how they are similar to tasks, for example, to other, other occupations like web administrator, database administrator. And by using how the tasks are similar, you can see how they can transition to other jobs and other sectors. So I begin to find new pathways, new, new ways out of your disruption. At the same time, task will be replaced by technology. Remember, jobs are not replaced job by job, but task by task. So if I just look at all the tasks that somebody does, and I look at which task is being disrupted, and when it's being disrupted, because they're all disrupted at different times, I begin to get a sense of the skill as well as the speed of the technology disruption. And so I can begin to get a sense of the risk profile of a particular job and how much time I have to help somebody. Lastly, is because the jobs, the tasks in different jobs are related, I can look at how the certain technology is disrupting different tasks in different occupations. And what I get is I get able to track disruption risks. I can also improve job transitions. And I can do so because the task gives precision. You can say that the future to be more resilient is to be more, have more social skills and more creativity, but it doesn't help you. Social skills in what? Creativity in what? Right? It's quite different. Whereas here I can tell you, you need to be social skills in negotiating user needs. It becomes more specific. So I give you precision and clarity. And the phrase that I use is that if skills give you a map, tasks give you a GPS. But more importantly for the theme of today's talk, I can then reimagine how to increase the value of the remaining tasks with the technologies that I choose to invest in. So by doing that, I help to preserve, maintain the jobs of the middle class, of people who might otherwise suffer from being displaced from a particular occupation. Lastly, even if I can't find the right technology, I can recombine some of these other tasks together that remain and create a new job and then find the ways to train the people to do that. And in doing so, what we do is we are helping people feel that, number one, there are multiple ways to go, even if your job is disrupted. I can take technology to improve your remaining tasks, make it more valuable, and I can redesign your job and make sure that you still have a job. Either way, I'm building confidence in a person because if the person doesn't feel that in two years' time, that's it, right? I worry about being out of a job. And more importantly, the job is so important for a chance of a better life. And my father was retrenched, and I've seen people retrenched. It's quite distressing not just for themselves, but for the family as well. So it's a chance of a better life that's very important. <coughs> and so what we are doing is, in the old days when we talk about tasks, people thought we we're talking about Taylorism, scientific management, Frederick Taylor, and that we're going to disaggregate everything, outsource them to technology and to around the world, and we're just going to make things very inhumane, right? We're going to dehumanize work and the workplace. What I've just shown is we're going to use tasks to try to make it more human, more, and to humanize the process of helping people to transition. And it's because of that that we were able to successfully make a proposal to the government and they are funding us to actually build a task database for Singapore. <coughs> because all these projections that you see from all around the world, they're all based on the United States occupational database. So everybody is making projections based on the same database. If you want to solve your country's problems, you need to have your own. And so we've gotten the money and we're building that now and we're in the midst of doing so. More importantly, we're partnering and with and fund getting funding from unions and companies to test our strategies, policies, so that we can help people improve in the adoption of technologies, the training, the disruption, as well as the transition to new jobs. And that's what we're doing now. And maybe to summarize, this section is to really say that we're doing this for a very simple reason. There are a lot of good things about living in cities and in countries, but they also have difficulties. And maybe a starting point for many of our initiatives must surely be to help people with the difficulties in life. And I think this approach of helping people tackle disruption is one way to go. We just had a meeting with a bunch of union leaders yesterday and one of the union leaders thanked us after that and said they think they were doing a very noble thing. And I think it's good to know that it's being recognized and it's being acknowledged. So that's my second section. My third section is Living Cities 2050. 
And my starting point, this is the most speculative part of my presentation today. My starting point is this BBC series that just started about, about a month ago. And you notice they're talking about cities, but they're not talking about buildings or smart cities or IoT. They're talking about nature's new wow. An interesting development because they're starting to realize that animals and the cities, you know, you shouldn't be just thinking of that animals belong in nature and humans belong in the cities. And when we like, we can you know, go and take a walk in the nature and sometimes the animals come into the city. We have to start thinking that maybe we should be coexisting in some way. And there was a book that came out last year by a Dutch uh, scientist. He called Darwin's Come to Town. And he realized that actually animals are evolving to the urban environment too. So an interesting statistic that he had was that different mos the mosquitoes in different sub-tube stations in London actually have a different genetic makeup. Right? And so it tells you that actually animals are also responding to the urban environment. So the larger question is, do we have a responsibility that not just to confine animals right, to nature and then to redefine and rethink what it means about nature and sustainability. And I want to show you a video that perhaps points a way forward of what it might look like uh, based again on Singapore's experience, but also gives you a sense of what's happening in Singapore. So let me start this video for you. This is the same river, by the way, that I talked about. So, so this was possible because the, the otters had disappeared from Singapore. We cleaned up the waterways, cleaned up the environment, and they came back. But more importantly, the ones that came back seemed to have a new relationship with the urban environment. And it's possible not just because the environment was clean, but because of the active efforts of different organizations and civic communities in Singapore. So there's a group called Otter Watch. What they did was, it's really a partnership between the academics, scientists, 
the government agencies as well as just normal volunteers, individuals, public citizens, helping to make sure that the authors, even though they're endangered, were safe. And how do I know they're serious about the work? Not just by reading newspapers, but one day I was cycling. Uh, on the weekends, I, I cycle around one of our uh, park connectors. And I saw an author run across the bridge. And I just went to take a look. And then a volunteer walked up to me and said, would you mind, uh, I know you saw the authors go into their little home. Would you mind not telling anybody that you saw them there? And I said, oh, why so? He said, because there are bad people around. We're trying to protect the authors. So it's interesting, right? You have people who are just through WhatsApp, finding ways right, to patrol the waterways, to patrol the areas and the homes that these animals live in, and to just try to make it safe, while trying to understand what is the natural thing to do so they don't interfere unnecessarily. So it becomes an interesting example. How is it that we can actually work closely together in the, organ in the city and the country to try to keep nature and to keep nature the way it is and to protect the animals? And because of some of the work that we did, not because of a top-down policy, but because of bottom-up initiative, the international scientific community has said that maybe we're a role model for how otters and animals and human beings can exist. And these scientists are interesting because they actually, some of them actually said that they've been studying otters for 30, 40 years. And the closest they ever got to an otter was actually in Singapore. Right? Before that, they had to look at it from afar through binocular lenses and so on. But Singapore is not perfect, you know, it's, we've got our challenges too. We continue to have many debates about how much of our nature to preserve. And I wonder on the left hand side whether that is a conversation that will ever ever settle. But at the same time, it also means that maybe we're not talking about this in an important way enough. So maybe we need to start thinking about the relationship between urban nature and wild and understand that they all meld together. And I know some of you are wondering, why do I have this photo on the right hand side? Right? And the reason is very simple, it's an example of how you know, we come together in a different way. Uh, these two couples, uh, this couple, actually came to Singapore because they read about the otters. So they contacted one of the volunteers and said, could you bring us to see the otters so that we can see them. Now, they came over, the guy here had decided quietly and secretly that he would propose to the girlfriend when they were here, when they saw the otters. And so they did, they saw the otters, they saw, he went on his knees, and in one of the most interesting episodes ever, the authors saw what was going on and came out and went to witness the proposal to the girlfriend. Right? So by maybe what I'm trying to say here is a small little anecdotal thing, a humorous thing, but maybe what we can do is we can reimagine what living means in a living city. Okay? So let me conclude. Um, in my first trip to Paris last, week, uh, last year, I was at the airport a bit earlier and I picked up an airport magazine. There was a very nice little sketch at the back. And it reminded me that maybe all the work that I'm doing in Singapore and in technology is really about the art of living. Um, and I hope I've demonstrated that to you today uh, through three types of imagination. Right? In 65 to 2019, using Singapore as an example, it was about solving problems, uh, whether it's housing, water, greening, environment, etc. It was really about overcoming constraints for the country, but largely to improve lives for people. The work that I do, Living Digital 2040, is really about taking task and old approach and giving it a new flavor and taking something that used to disrupt people's lives to actually make people's lives better. So a CEO of a company actually told me that he, I sound like I'm trying to disrupt disruption and that's not a bad way to think about it. But my personal motivation is really to help people tackle life's difficulties. And lastly, the most speculative bit of my presentation, Living Cities 2050, uh, is really that maybe we need to rethink our relationship with a lot of things around us, especially nature, greenery, the wow. And maybe we can reimagine what living together, the together actually means, and what the living actually means. In closing, I just want to encourage you to do this. I think most of you are, are going to go on to business careers and public, pu public policy and so on. Uh, you're going to be talking about strategies, forces, trends, development, big ideas, big words, right? Some of you might even be contributing to the buzzwords. I just want to remind you that after you graduate, please remember that at the end of every buzzword are people's lives with aspirations and ambitions, and we should try to, our very best to make sure that we meet those needs and to make lives better for everybody. And with that, I end my presentation. I think we still have a bit of time for Q&A.
คำคำไทยสิลิงไทยสิลิงคิงวังไทยไทยสิลิงไทย I think you've got questions, right? You, you're going to ask questions. Yeah, I'll pass them on my. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. Okay. Yeah. Hi. Hi. It was a great talk. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Yeah. To ask all your questions first, or I'll take question by question. Okay. Does anyone have a question similar to hers, or anyone from the audience has a question similar to hers? Okay. Yes. Maybe. Yeah. yeah. So my my question is quite similar to um, this one. Uh, I would like to know if um, uh, the smart city uh, can be implemented in the um, urban master plan of the developing. Okay, so I think the challenge with the smart cities debate, and which is why you're asking those questions, is precisely because they focus mostly on the larger cities and in fact the more advanced developed cities. And the reason is because those are the ones that have the resources and those are the ones that seem to be at the stage that they can absorb a lot of the new technologies. Uh, let's not forget what's going on here. Who is pushing the smart cities agenda? If you trace its evolution, yes, there was some bit of it by the government, but a lot of it, if you look deep enough, and of in recent years has been pushed forward by the corporate agenda. And so let's not deny that there's a big corporate agenda in this. And what that means is when you're in a corporate agenda, are you going to be interested in a big contract or a small contract? Obviously a big contract. So which is why they focus on larger cities. So if you focus at that level, it will look like all the things that they talk about in the reports they read about smart cities will not be relevant for less developed economies or cities and countries. So if you take that, if you take that away, go one level down and ask, let's look at what technology can do. Right? And interestingly, what you've noticed is all the international organizations from the UN, the World Bank, the UNDP, etc., they all started to look at technology as a way to help emerging economies as well as developing countries. And the reason they do that is very simple. If you take technology for what it is, you ask yourself, what is it you can do with the technology that will make things better? And so one of the things I've suggested to some international organizations is you need to have what I call a hierarchy of smart city needs. Right? That means depending on your stage of development, you might need to think about your circumstances different, differently. So when I speak to UNDP, for example, one of them told me that in some countries and some cities, even putting a laptop on every civil servant's desk is a disruption. Right? So it doesn't matter. That's how we Singapore started too. You know, when Singapore started on our national computerization drive, this was in the 1980s, uh, it, was, it, you know, it, it sounds like it was a very nice plan and all, but it was a very messy process. What they did was they just take, took 300 people who were willing to be trained for a week by an Australian instructor and some we got from the military people who were injured and you know, had nothing else to do in the military, we got them from there. We trained 300 of them and then we told them, okay, we're going to send each one of you, two of you, to different government ministries. You just find something to computerise. Right? It doesn't matter what you computerise, just find something to computerise. And that's how we started. It was very scrappy, it was very bootstrapping, very lean startup approach. Right? So I think you can do the same, where ask yourself, what is it that you need? Then, because technologies are more accessible, more affordable, then move up progressively and do that systematically. And I think that's the way to think about smart cities and not be caught up in the conversation that is, in some sense, dominated by large companies and large cities. Um, 
I, I don't really know about being happy because there are all these studies that show that, you know, the, that happiness tapers off after a while. Um, so in my work, I don't focus on happiness per se. I focus on a very, uh, very nuts and bolts, the basic stuff, right? which means uh, if you are a working professional, chances are you want to have a decently paying job that doesn't treat you too badly and with some reasonable prospects of making progress in your career. I, I think that's what I focus on. And then after that, what you do with the money you earn to make yourself happy or unhappy is up to you, right? I mean, that's kind of my view. Then for most of those working professionals, when they get married, they have families, right? Um, whether it's a conventional family or a traditional family, it doesn't matter to me. I'm, uh, it, it, it's, it's not the form that matters, it's the fact you have a family. You have somebody else to care for, you may have kids to care for, you may have other family members to care for. It's the ability to care for them in some of the basic provisions of life, right? From education to healthcare, to even just making sure that they've got good, decent work. So I focus more on those things, and let's get that set up first. And then I think happiness is a very individual sort of thing. But what we can do, which is a related conversation to happiness, is this whole idea of well-being. I think well-being does cover things like your economic security, your health. At the same time, because of the modern stresses of our so-called urban life, right, we are getting more stressed out by work because of 24-7 communications and all. Uh, we might have to think a little bit about that because those might have long-term systemic issues as well for society. So um, I know in a lot of conversations, people say that the future of education is one where you're going to train people to computer programmers, learn AI, and you know, stuff like that. Uh, I take it at a slightly more basic level because I said, you know, for, for anyone who's gone through the last computer revolution when the PC became the big thing, we were also told that we should learn computer programming. And so I'm asking what is different, right? And I think what is different, partly based on the task approach, and what I think is important based on our work in the future education, is one is we're not teaching our students to actually take advantage of all the full suite of technologies that are available to them out there. So take for example Facebook, right? Um, I don't know what the latest price is, but about two years ago you can get on Facebook marketing and advertising that's just seven dollars uh, per day. And at seven dollars, if you actually looked at, I'm sure some you have, if you looked at the marketing engine that they have, the way you could target and how it tells you how to target, you'd be amazed at the amount of data they've collected, but you'd be amazed at its reach as well. If you teach students to be able to do that, they can actually use that to harness people towards good causes, to become entrepreneurs, but they would also understand some of the issues with all the problems that we've had with Facebook and Cambridge Analytica. So you understand intimately, you don't just understand it theoretically. But there are so many powerful technologies from your Photoshop to your Facebook. And why is that important to teach them? Is because if technology is going to keep advancing, then your advantage comes from knowing how to take advantage of the new technologies in a more efficient and effective way. And not by learning programming, because somebody will always be a better programmer than you. So you can learn as a basic skill, mostly to understand what is computational thinking, so that when you talk to a programmer, he doesn't try to pull a fast one on you. But what I think is even more important as a skill is to know how to take what is out there and the advances that come with it and then to turn that into something that's extremely valuable. I think that's one. The other thing that we think is very important is to use technology to try to bring people together. So one of the ideas we propose to in our book is, you know, we've got this issue, right? The high income segments will send their kids to certain schools. The low income will be will have no choice. Often they'll send it to usually not such a good school. And if you ask the good teachers to go and move to a not so good school, uh, it's going to be difficult. And then the good school will not take the teachers from a not so good school. So you have a problem, right? It, the problem just perpetuates itself. So while it has a systemic issue, uh, and there could be other policy interventions, one of the interventions that we propose, for example, is you could have students from different schools peer mentoring and peer tutoring each other. So you could be, you do a few things. One is if you are exposed to better pedagogies, you could be transferring that to schools, students from schools with weaker pedagogies. At the same time, if there's a student from a different school who's very good in something, he could be peer tutoring somebody else in so-called even a good school. And what you do is you, you start to help people realize that there are good, talented, bright people everywhere. And you learn to realize that just because I'm in a good school and I'm in a certain segment doesn't mean that my world is just that segment. 
is to allow the intermingling and exposure to different segments of society that I think will help to build up, rebuild some of the social capital that we've lost in the last 10, 20 years because of various reasons. Right, so this would be a two things. One, learn to mentor, teach somebody else something you're good at and to raise somebody up at the same time, either through face-to-face -face or nowadays possibly through digital mentoring, digital means. And the other thing is learn to teach students how to harness what's out there. And if you can do that, I think you'll be making your students very resilient and you'll also be building social capital. Yes, uh, I can take two if you ask questions. That is, you, got, you throw two both questions in, I will address them at the same time. Yeah, there's one there, and I think there's one behind. Yes, I can. Yes. Yeah. It is, it is. Yeah. Yeah, so, so uh, okay, maybe I'll take the other question too and then I'll address, but it is happening in Singapore and I'll explain why in a short while. So let me, let me address, I think, the social issue and then specific to a future of work. Uh, Singapore is seeing that as well. And why are we seeing that is actually the divides are not just between urban and rural. And in Singapore, we don't have rural. But in many large cities, including, for example, Melbourne and in Taiwan, for example, as well, you find that the further you get away from the city centre, the lower your economic opportunities, right? And there's some of the increasing amount of challenges. So in Singapore, for example, 10 years ago, I had a geographer tell me that the people that she noticed staying in the most northern part of Singapore, the students seem to have a very less cosmopolitan and sophisticated view of the world, even at their age, you know, and even though they went to similar schools. It's just the exposure they had compared to students who stayed closer to the centre of the city. And now in the last one, two years or so, it's come to, it's come to a fall, it's come to a hit because people are now realising in Singapore that because of the way we set our systems, that we do have different social economic segments. And some people actually do live only within their segments and their bubbles. And one of the challenges we face is how to try to break through these things. Our Deputy Prime Minister himself says that there has been no country or city in history that's been able to reverse this effect. And so he's very worried. And the only time in history that this has been reversed is where there's been a great disruption, war, disease, whatever, right? And I don't think we want to go there. So what Singapore is trying to do is trying to examine now to see whether we can move and reverse that process in some way. Fortunately, I guess in Singapore, we have two, three mechanisms working in our favour. I hope they work more than they work less. One is public housing. One of the things we've done is simply because we've had these people who are living in the north seem to have a slightly lower, different view. One of the things we've done is actually one of our most newest and, uh, well, maybe nicest and the most well-connected new public housing estates where we now give a lot of young people public houses actually in the northeast of Singapore. And that has helped to move and equalise things a little bit, but just distributing things, right, just through urban planning. The other thing that we have in our favour is what we call, we still have compulsory national service, military service. Um, I, I still, I, I'm still serving because after you do your full-time military service, you're obligated, you're required by law to continue serving up to 40 days a year to refresh you know, and keep your seals current. So I just did my 20 years of national service uh, last year. And what that does, it actually mixes people together and it realised that with all so many instances, right? We have so many instances of people saying that I thought that person from a different ethnicity, social segment, occupation would be the one I couldn't trust. But when, the, when it comes to the crunch, in a military setting, you find that the person you could trust is actually that person you thought you couldn't trust. So it disrupts your, your mentalities, it makes you more open. So 
So hopefully we can do something about that. And we're also intervening in many other ways. So for lower income groups, we know that early child education is important. So we're putting a lot of resources into early child education support for low income families. So that is happening. And just to make it, may help you see that it's a global phenomenon. In Melbourne, for example, even people who live on the outs in the periphery of the city have about, I think they have only, uh, they have about four jobs available to each population, each citizen. Whereas in the core of the city, they have 10 jobs per citizen. And so you, and then the income is actually lower in the outskirts than in the middle. So that is a problem that cities will face, and it is a version of the problem between urban and rural. So distance still matters, even in the digital age. And that may be an interesting question that we need to try to settle. On the future of work, I think what we need to do is we do, I feel we do need to move to a more task-based approach. But in order for countries to do that, they need to develop their own version of a task database. So one of the things that we do realize is that the United States States took about 40 to 50 years to build up the task database. It started as a research project, became important, and now it's become you know, the key database. We are trying to see, as ambitious as we are, we are trying to see whether we can build that in a shorter amount of time. And the way we're doing it is two, two to three ways. So one is to take what they've used, and then instead of doing everything from scratch, right, what we do is we take what the US has, then we do focus groups with specific occupations, and say, you know, is this relevant, not relevant? Can you adapt it? Can you modify it? So that helps to shorten the process. The other thing we do is, of course, we use things like artificial intelligence, web scraping, to try to use existing data sets to try to bring in and try to augment them and mesh them up, to stack them up, so-called. Right? So I think that's one, one thing we can do. I think the other thing we could do, uh, so that's one thing. I think the other thing that we could do, and that I've heard quite a bit, is you know, pay a little bit more attention when you do what we call any digital transformation, and that's the buzzword now. And we've told the unions this, and we've told companies this. When you set up a digital transformation plan, or you set up a training plan of some sort, saying I want to upgrade and so on, have you actually specified how exactly are your citizens and your employees going to benefit from this? If you cannot spell it out in some amount of clarity, with some amount of clarity, chances are it's a bit of a vanity project. It's a bit of a just capital-driven, finance-driven project. So, I propose that as a very simple thing because it doesn't change anything that city mayors or company strategies want to do. I'm just asking you to be very clear and specific how you're helping people and to make that as clear as possible. And you know, the benefit of this is if you make that clear, chances are you get more buy-in for your change management, whether it's at the country level or the company level, and you're going to move along much more quickly. Right? So spend the extra one, two months thinking about it. You might speed up three, four months in return. So it's not a unproductive exercise, at the same time it's not a costly exercise. So do the two, invest in a database, think about how to help people, but at the same time start developing the ways to help people, to make it clear to people how they should be benefiting. Thank you, thank you very much for the talk. Yeah. Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>